Well, we're picking right back up where we left off in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And today we're going to cover verses 7 through 10. Um, slight switch of, su- switch of subject. Yesterday, the Apostle Paul was emphasizing our unity in Christ. Now he's going to talk about our, our distinctions a little bit in Christ because we're, we're meant to be, as the body of Christ, an interdependent body. We are different, and yet we serve the same Lord. We're submitted to the same Lord. We're walking by the same truth. But we have distinction of personhood, distinction of experiences, life learnings. We have distinction, we're going to learn a term here, of gifts, spiritual gifts that God gives us. And those distinctions are not meant to be minimized. They're meant to be maximized, but with a focus on unifying ourselves as an interdependent functional body for Christ to live his life through. Let me pick up reading. So we're starting in verse 7. It says, But to each one of us, Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now, this grace has been given, it's looking at the grace we experience based on our conduct, uh, our performance in life. In other words, God gives grace to all of us, unmerited mercy and favor, but maybe I needed a much larger portion of grace because my conduct and my character uh, was, was further down the sin track than somebody else's. But the grace is appropriate for each of us, but it is different for each of us. And this is also leaning toward this notion of spiritual gifts. You'll hear it in a minute. So let me start again. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. So, here it's talking about Christ's ascension. And you might recall, you know, Jesus said it's important. He told his disciples last night, it's important to you that, that I go to the Father, that I ascend, in other words, because I'll send the Spirit, another comforter to you, another helper, the paraclete, uh, and he'll manifest my presence in you forever and then through you forever, and he'll ultimately give you power to be my martyrs, to be my witnesses, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So here Christ is, is or here the Spirit, Scripture is talking about how when Christ ascended, um, meaning that he completely fulfilled his mission on this earth, he completely manifested the heart and character of God. The world couldn't pull him down. Sin couldn't pull him down. The devil couldn't pull him down. Um, He gave himself sacrificially right to the end. It says now, because he is counted worthy, you read Revelation 5 and 6, all of heaven is going crazy, counting him as the Lamb of God who is worthy to rule and reign. So now the power of the Spirit is given to him, and he sends the Spirit back to manifest his presence on earth in his followers. And then in a particular way, uh, the Holy Spirit gives certain facets of Christ's character and abilities to each of the members of Jesus' body or to each Christian, meaning this. The Scripture talks about Spirit-given gifts. These are manifestations of the ministering capacity of Christ, Uh, not so much the character, but of his ministering capacity. For example, it might be a teaching gift, or it might be an encouragement gift, or it might be a comforting gift, or it might be a healing gift. So Jesus had all the giftings, but now he gives individuals in his body certain gifts, not all the gifts. Uh, You can read about these spiritual gifts. The list are given in Romans chapter 12, Verses 6 through 8, you have a few listed there. 1 Corinthians 12, the twelfth entire 12th chapter, is the largest description of the spiritual gifts. There, there's lots of them listed there. In this book of Ephesians we're looking at, we're going to get a little further down. You'll see some of the gifts listed, just, just a few categories. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, all the gifts are divided into communication gifts and physical serving gifts, hands-on gifts. Point being this. The manifest presence of Christ is going to continue. In other words, when Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 18, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is still building his church, but he's now building it through us. And he distributes some of his gifting to each and every one of us. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 11, it says these spiritual gifts are given by grace. In other words, we don't choose them. We don't ask for them. We don't determine which ones we get. It says God chooses. He gives distinctly to us the ones that he wants us to have. It could be one gift. It could be more than one. But 
these spiritual gifts are, again, capacities to manifest the ministering ability, the serving ability, the communication ability of Christ so that he can go on being manifested to the world through his church, his many-membered body. So that's what it's talking about when he ascended. He gave gifts to men. Now, it's going to say something here next that sounds a little confusing. Let me go back. What does he ascended, verse 9, what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? Verse 10, he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Now, some take from that that Jesus descended into hell or into Hades or into the abode of the dead, which is really what the word means. And, and the book of First Peter does indicate that that is true. But the main emphasis here is that Jesus is the one that uh, because he fully manifested the character of God has been now considered worthy to rule and to reign and to use his power uh, fully. Satan had thrown suspicion on the character of God and now Jesus has completely removed that suspicion. And so now he's worthy to give gifts and to empower human beings to, um, to become servants of God in the same vein that he himself was. So don't get too hung up about, you know, did he descend into uh, the lower regions of hell? It does talk about in First Peter, he talked about the spirits that were in prison, those that were um, affiliated with the time of Noah just prior to the flood. And that, that's a whole different discussion. But some want to take the Apostles' Creed where it says, and Jesus descended into hell. Well, hell, not exactly. It's, it's the abode of the dead is what the word really means, not hell in the terms that people today who haven't studied the scriptures think of hell. They think of it in terms of this being this place of eternal burning and torture. It's not the way that it's always used in the New Testament. We do have a place called the Lake of Fire, which is used in Revelation 20, verse 15. But that is distinct from Hades or hell or Gehenna, the words that Jesus used, which was just a trash dump in his day. But it was spiritually used of those that reject God's purpose for their life and then become, by virtue of that, those that are only good to be, you know, uh, destroyed, ultimately, is what it's talking about. Anyway, one last pass on this. So we're now the body. Jesus gave up his body on the cross to reveal the trustworthiness and sacrificial love of God to draw us to himself. Now when we put our trust in him and become his followers, we become his hands, we become his feet, we become his eyes, his mouthpiece. We all have distinction of function, but we stay united in an interdependent body of Christ so that Christ can continue his work, be manifested to the world uh, through our corporate, uh, cor corporate interdependent unity. Okay, a lot of stuff there. I, I hope it's helpful. Thank you.